It is go time. Okay, good evening, gentlemen. Let's go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where we will be probably wrapping up chapter 4 tonight. We may get into chapter 5 tonight. We shall see uh, how far we get. But we have been in this study for several weeks now, right? We're probably approaching near three months or so now. And we have seen that this letter is written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to the church at Corinth. We've seen him addressing so many things. Even right from chapter 1, he addresses problems with division and how, remember, they were following men, Apollos and Peter and, and uh, Paul, and just the divisions that are being caused there by, remember, the spiritual immaturity. Really, he was kind of saying to them, you guys should be much further along in your walk than you are now. Uh, they certainly weren't very far in their sanctification <coughs> process, and so that's causing a lot of issues, which immaturity does, right? Uh, immaturity always can cause issues, and certainly spiritually in a church, that is the case as well. And uh, he even said to them, you know, you seem like you're just normal mortal men, like you're just acting like carnal fleshly men. You've been saved by the Spirit, you're being transformed, and yet you certainly don't act like that. And so he continues to address those types of things going into chapter 3. And, um, you know, that he's saying that, remember, nobody's really anything. I'm not anything. Apollo isn't anything worth following, you should be following Christ, because though I plant and Apollos watered, you know, it's God who gives the increase. It's it's God the one that does the work, and so uh, God is the one that, who the credit goes to, and so again, we see Paul's humility in all those things, and then we see it again in chapter 4, the last couple of weeks that we've been in there, how Paul is talking to them about, um, you know, how they should view the apostles or their leaders, because remember, they're kind of making them like the rock star mega church guys that you know they're putting them on pedestals and the problem being that a lot of the men they're putting on pedestals are false teachers remember he's talking about the false teachers coming in and and going back to the building master builder analogy that he talked about how i've laid the proper foundation of jesus christ which is the only foundation so we don't lay a different foundation ever but you're allowing these false teachers to come in and build these structures on the foundation that aren't fitting and so we got to knock all that down we got to get rid of all that and we got to start building the proper structure. Um, so he tells them how they should be looking at their leaders and looking at Paul and Apollos and other worthy, worthy leaders. And he says, remember that uh, you, you should be looking at us, look at how the world looks at us. The world doesn't look at us as rock stars, you know, and doesn't put us on pedestals. Um, but you and your wisdom, remember, excuse me, the flesh and the wisdom of God, which is the true wisdom, which is only given by the Spirit of God, and so, uh, you know, he says, we of the apostles are viewed of, as last of all by the world, you know, that we are fools for Christ's sake. Because remember, thinks that the, the gospel and the preaching and so he says, we are us as fools and thinks we're stupid uh, and they think that they're wise, but we know that the, the reverse is true, okay? And so um, he says that you should... Uh, be as we are, that, that uh, you guys act like you're all this and you don't even need us anymore. Remember, he goes through a lot of irony and some kind of some sarcasm saying, well, uh, we're weak, but you guys are strong. Uh, you know, we're nothing, but you guys know everything. Uh, you, you don't even need us. You're so, you're so awesome and so wise in your own self that you don't even need us anymore. And so obviously he's just trying to point out to the fact of them that that is incorrect thinking. Uh, you know, that stinking thinking, right, that they shouldn't be in that frame of mind. Uh, but to look at us, that we are poorly dressed. Remember, we hunger, we are homeless, uh, we labor with our hands. It says when we are persecuted, we endure, and when we're slandered, we entreat. Okay, so wrapped up last week in verse 13 where he says, We have become and, and are still like the scum of the world, or the refuge of all things, or the Nazbe says, uh, the dregs. Remember the dregs, the, the scum that's left in the bottom of your coffee cup that you don't want any part of. That's us, is what Paul's saying. So, you know, we are lowly, and, and remember, they are to be lowly, and they are to be humble, and we're going to continue to see Paul unpack that through the rest of, of chapter 4 here, certainly. Um, but any, any thoughts or comments to start out with or, or input to, to add to that? <clears throat> Quiet off the get go. That's all right. <coughs> Scum of the earth and garbage of the world pretty much sums it up right? pretty clearly. Yeah, yeah. And I think when we had the proper view, I think that's, I mean, Paul, that's the view Paul has of himself, and I think it's right. And certainly we understand the apostles had a specific calling on their lives that 
you know, the rest of us can't really relate to. Because even as a pastor, uh, certainly Paul was an elder, so was John or whatever, but they are also apostles, right? Uh, so they, they certainly were called to the life that, that Christ had for them, which we all are. But we know that their lifestyle as an apostle was to be made lowly and to be made humbled by God. Uh, to be his representative of Christ, we, he, they were, they were going to be humbled. They were certainly going to be persecuted. They certainly were going to endure persecution. And most of them, we know, were going to give their lives for the cause. Okay, so, um, you know, they weren't going to be the, the mega church rock star pastors that we talked about. They certainly weren't having their own private jets or four or five of them, right? Uh, they weren't going to have any of the luxuries of the ways of the world because they were viewed, to, they were to be different than the world. Okay, so, um, so, so are we. But th that doesn't mean, you know, that we don't, uh, that, that we can't have cars or we can't do things, but we, we have to understand that we have to always have our priorities in the, in the right place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we've got to be seeking, you know, as Jesus says, seek first the king, you know, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Your father knows well, you, you know, what you need, and uh, he's going to take care of you and provide for you. So you just seek the kingdom, you seek God's will, and, and allow God to take care of the rest of those things. And uh, certainly that's easy to say, and we've certainly heard it in Scripture so many times, uh, but in day-to-day -day life it's difficult, right? It's a, it's a struggle. Uh, we have a struggle with the flesh, and so it's certainly difficult, and our priorities do get out of whack, and, and it's done very easily, and, and it, it can be difficult sometimes to get them back into place. So uh, we got to be mindful of that and, and just continue to look at ourselves more like what Paul's trying to tell them how to look at themselves. Don't get all haughty and puffed up. You're you're nothing, <laughs> okay? Look at me. I'm I'm Paul or I'm Apollos, and God's done great things that you've seen Him do through me, and I'm nothing, okay? So if I'm nothing, you're nothing. Well, like we're all nothing in this because God's the only something. <clears throat> Jesus is the only something, and you're a nobody, okay? You're a nobody. He's the somebody, and like uh, and let's go tell everybody. <laughs> like that song. That's exactly right. That's what's in my brain right now. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, I like those words. Yep. I'm a nobody, right? And telling everybody about somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's Jesus. Okay? So that's the key. Well, let's look at the rest of verse uh, or chapter 14. Excuse me, chapter 4, starting with verse 14. Rewind that, replay. Here we go. Verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. This is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. So thankful for this time. So thankful for the work that you do in us through your word and through your spirit. And uh, we certainly ask that you would do that here tonight through your name. Amen. Okay, back to verse 14. So he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but... Or in contrast, right, to admonish you as beloved children. Okay, so he refers to them, obviously, here as children. And we certainly, I know that John says that as well. Um, I think about Third John, uh, I think verse 4, talks about, um, I have no greater joy than to see that my children walk in the truth. Okay, he's speaking of believers who are his spiritual children. As you see, look down here in verse 17 where Paul says, I send you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, right? Uh, referring to that spiritual mentorship, you know, the father-son, the mentor relationship there that, uh, that um, he'll get more to in, in just a minute here. Okay, so these harsh words that Paul's just been saying to them that we recapped from last week, um, you know, with all the irony and, and things that he's saying to them, he's saying, look, I'm not saying that to you to be mean. I'm saying that to you for your good. I, I'm doing you a benefit here. I'm doing what I'm called to do here. And feel inferior, certainly, at all. Um, flip over to Ephesians chapter 6, if you would, please. <clears throat> Paul talks 
about this and the you know parental um, construct here. As in, in Ephesians 6, he's talking about children and obeying your parents and the relationship. There's four. It says, Father, and the Lord. Isn't that really what Paul's doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, Paul is looking at them and saying, look, the rod, right? Uh, the, Jesus, uh, the word talks about not sparing your children the rod. So the rod of correction, meaning. And so that's what he's saying is, don't provoke your children to anger. You should do it in the right manner, uh, right? We're not to provoke them to anger, to try to do things to push and prod at them, uh, to, to get them to respond in a, in a wrong way. But we are to correct them. That is part of, that's part of your duty as a father, right? If you're a father here tonight, your duty to your children, certainly, you know, when they're younger, it's more so than when they're older, but it still, you know, continues to be the case. Uh, that, that uh, you just like children obeying and honoring your parents. It's, it doesn't say that when you become, you know, 30, you don't have to honor and obey your parents anymore, right? Um, so you are to help your children. You are to um, parent them, and you are to correct them. And so in the, in the likewise <coughs> manner, Paul is trying to do that here uh, with these, you know, these spiritual children that he has at the church at Corinth. <coughs> so, again... Not to make you angry or frustrate you or provoke you in any way, uh, but rather he's doing this for their benefit, right? To correct them and help them mature in the proper understanding. Because really, what's the problem here? When we when we think about the divisions and all the things he's been addressing, we're going to get into sexual immorality and some different issues here coming up in chapter five. But thus far through the first four chapters, what's really at the heart of all the issues that he's addressing and talking about? They've kind of lost sight of the, of the biblical. I mean, in, in a sense, they're off track. I mean, they're sure. They're certainly off track. So certainly, he's trying to, you know, pat them on the butt and get them back over here in the right in the right course. I mean, childers. <laughs> yeah, but but what's the thing we've been talking about? Uh, you know, for right pride. Certainly, you know, pride, and he talks about those who are arrogant. You know, he's going to talk about that in the next couple of verses here um, because they are. They are certainly prideful and arrogant mm -hmm. in their thinking and what they're doing. And, and then they're shunning others because, you know, well, I'm a Paul, and so you follow Apollos. You know, I'm better than you. And just all the pride and all the arrogance and even shunning Paul to the degree of, well, I follow Apollos, so Paul, you know, is, is way over there. And not understanding how earlier he said, no, all things are for your benefit. All things that Christ gives the church is for you, right? Paul's for your benefit. Apollos is for your benefit. Every everything that's good that's of Christ is for your benefit. Um, so it's not to put one up and exalt one and put one down. Um, and certainly that can be pride, you know, and, and arrogant. But um, you know, also I was thinking the immaturity. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah, that's you know, you would hope and you would think, and I would su suspect and and expect that as you mature in your faith and in your sanctification process, you should grow to be less prideful. <laughs> okay? Humble. Right, and more humble. Exactly, Manny. Um, certainly, it's a, it's, a, it's a big bell curve, right? It's a learning curve for a lot of us. Some of us do better at it than others. Some of us struggle more with pride than others do. And, and you know, we all have different struggles in different areas. We're all, we're all different in that way. But it certainly should be the case um, that as you mature, because what does sanctification process look like? We know you've got, it's growing to be more like Christ, right? Growing to be more holy as, as God is holy, as Jesus is holy. So how do you grow to be more like Jesus? Well, you've got to know what the Word says about how to do that. Uh, Romans 12 talks about, uh, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Somebody's car alarm. That's really loud. I think somebody... it's next door. Yeah, that's a loud Sound like. So... Nice little, nice, oh, there he goes, nice little alarm clock, that'll get you up in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that's the key, is as you're progressing, um, you know, you've got to have the Word of God, and obviously through His Spirit, who reveals things to you and teaches you, you've got to grow in maturity, so you've got to grow in knowledge, and in understanding, and then what's to come with that is application, right? He's changing you by renewing your mind. Uh, renewing your mind according to the scriptures and renewing your will and all those things to be lining up more with his as you grow. But if you don't grow, 
and you don't mature, then you just sit there on the milk, right? You, you can't just sit there on the milk. Uh, that's not what it's supposed to look like. We don't have, you know, Hunter is going to be, you know, six years old. He's not still on a baby's bottle. I mean, that's not normal, right? You, you've got to start feeding them food at a certain age that's appropriate, right? But it is certainly an age-appropriate thing, yes? So new believers do need milk, right? And they do need a, a process of which you, you know, are weaning them off of those things and into more mature things and into, you know, you don't pop out the, the baby day one and give them filet mignon. Um, so same thing in the spiritual walk, but remember with me that Paul is writing this letter now to them two to three years after he had already been there. So this is two to three years down the road now, and they're still stuck in the same place. And that's part of his frustration at the beginning of the letter. And what he's saying is, this isn't right for, for what's happening. You shouldn't be doing this. And so I think all the things we're talking about all go together. And for me, I really view it as stemming out of the immature. If you're not maturing, you're not in the word, and you're not, and you're listening to, remember, they're caught up in all the false teachings. They're listening to the teachings of the world. So all that's coming in, and they're building this, you know, this worldview that's really corrupted by the, the secular worldview, and they don't have the biblical foundation view growing in any way. They're just, they're just all over the place. So, of course, they're not going anywhere. Yeah, but I think that's one of the reasons he reminded them when he was with them, how humble he was, how he came to them, nothing flamboyant, yeah. not with fancy words. They were just mere men. They dressed poorly. Right. Their hands were beat up from working. Right. And they forgot that. Right. Totally forgot that. Yeah, exactly. Good example. You know what I mean? Right. They're being good examples. Sure. Look at look at us and look, look at what we up. do. And and they weren't looking at them. No. They, they went to the other leaders, the false teachers and those out in the outside world, the philosophers the culture they were in, um, that was rampant and all that and wanted all the flashy stuff and all the worldly exciting stuff, right? Uh, good thing that doesn't happen today. <laughs> it kind of reminds you of the scripture where it talks about, you know, being double-minded and just getting blown, yeah. you know, all, you know, the here and there and everything. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, right, to be mature so that you're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Right, you should be able to discern things. But how do you, how are you going to be capable and able to discern things? Only with some maturity and some wisdom, you know, to be able to discern those things at all, uh, which obviously the Lord grants. Okay, good. Stephen says, brother, you, 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 you want to have 10,000 instructors. Yes. But you don't have many fathers in Christ. Right. Exactly. Yeah, so, so good. Take us right there, uh, Pete. Verse 15. For you, if you had countless tutors, um, is what I've got in my NASB notes, um, countless guides, um, is what the ESV here says, in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. So Paul is telling them, look, he alone. He's saying, I alone am in your spiritual father. You, you can have lots of guides, and you can have even Apollos, and even the others who are coming there that are your pastors, and some are te good teachers there. Uh, but So they certainly are your tutors, right? Your help and your guide. But I am your spiritual father, and that's why he's addressing them, obviously, as, you know, as children. Um, so, you know, stating and saying factually and boldly that, look, uh, God used me to bring you to Christ. Because, obviously, we know Faith comes by hearing here the word of God. Well, who was the one that preached in Corinth and planted the church? God used Paul to do that. So he's saying, look, I was there, and that's how he said earlier, that I laid the proper foundation. I know what I did. I preached Christ, and Christ is the foundation, and he's the one that built this church that's happening in Corinth. Um, so, you know, he's, he's calling them to recognize how they've esteemed these false teachers and allowed, again, that secular worldview to, to creep in and just take over from them to where they don't even look at Paul how you're talking about, Manny. You know what I mean? They, they just they just kind of cast him to the side. They're not even esteeming him at all, looking at him. They're esteeming all these other guys uh, and just and just kind of throwing Paul to the side. And Paul's just like, look, man, I'm, I'm the guy that, that God put there to open your eyes to the truth of the scriptures and to the gospel. The foundation was planted because God put me there to plant the foundation. Mm -hmm. That's how I know that it was done properly, and that's why he calls himself, you know, the the one father that you have uh, is me, not any of these other types. So you shouldn't be esteeming them and looking towards them. You should be looking towards me and listening to me, 
which you have not been doing, which is why I'm writing you this letter, admonishing you now to tell you, get your act straight, correction and rebuke and reproof is here, and now it's time to it's time for me to bring the rod a little bit, and you need to get in line, you know, um, or suffer the consequences, right? It does sound like he keeps, like you were pointing on earlier, that he keeps pointing back to, to remember right. when you were first saved, like remember, you know, There, it's on fire. Right. You know, right. On the edge of their seat, and now they're, they don't need them anymore. <laughs> right. And, and isn't that so true? I mean, that just is how everything tends to be. You know, the second law of thermodynamics. You know, all, all things are going down. Uh, because that is how it is. Like, like you're saying, that's a perfect picture, you know, that, that he does see, keep saying to, to remind them of what happened. And again, that was a couple of years prior. So he's been gone now. And yeah, while Paul's there and doing the planning and the spirit's working and moving like I said everybody's excited and hanging on every word and yeah yeah it's good and then the guy leaves and now you know it just slowly you know fades away to where now you're two years down the road what's happening over there you know uh you know as john talks about that in revelation uh, you know you lost your first love jesus says to one of the seven churches in one of the letters there um you know then you've lost that first love and so that's something certainly that uh, believers have the tendency to do. It can happen, and that's certainly not what, you know, that's what we don't want to happen to us, uh, to lose that first love for, for Christ and for the gospel and for uh, that passion, you know, that, and the desire that he's put in us to, uh, you know, we're not supposed to hide that light, right? You don't hide that under a bushel. You know, you want to, we want to keep that fire ignited. And, uh, and through the Holy Spirit, through fellowship, and through preaching and teaching the Word, and reading of the Word, and studying your, your, the Word yourself, and praying, and all those things, you gotta keep, you got to keep it fueled. You know, you got to keep fueling the fire. And so uh, they certainly tend to, uh, tend to have a problem with that. And so Paul is certainly urging them here. So as you guys stated, <clears throat> he's urging them to follow him as an example, um, admonishing them, and, and look, really pointing to himself again. And sometimes... If we, if we take this, I think, incorrectly, we see this in other letters of Paul because most of the letters in the New Testament that he writes, he writes to churches to address issues, okay? Um, maybe with the exception of Philippians, I can think of, where he really doesn't give rebuke and correction. Most all the other letters, he does. Um, that's kind of part of the point of the letter is to say, you need to work on this, you need to work on this, you need to keep working on this. And so sometimes we can think that Paul is coming in, at this area of like where we would in our in our humanity, which he certainly was human, um, so I'm sure he was capable of doing this too and you know, it's not like he didn't sin or have the wrong motives or wrong attitudes sometimes too, Paul was a man, yes, he's not Jesus, okay but, but a lot of times you will see him saying that, you know, um, like look at me, follow me do as I do, you know, and so that can certainly sound prideful you know, or sound arrogant but knowing Paul as we do through, you know, the consistency of his writings, you see the humility constantly. And he is able to stand on that firmly, again, as I said earlier, more than the rest of us, because he is an apostle of Christ. Mm -hmm. An apostle being a, a representative of Christ, who was hand-chosen by Christ, right? Knocked off his horse and talked to by Christ and said, you're on my team now recruitment time is on it's time for you to buck up here's what you're going to do here's the, the the struggle and the tribulation and the suffering and the persecution you're going to go through because of what you're going to do for me and you're going to do it and and i'm going to empower you to do it and certainly he empowered them to you know heal people and to do all the things that the apostles were empowered to do paul was one of those so he can certainly stand on the ground of saying look jesus himself chose me and equip me to do this. Right. So you can stand firm on believing. You can take what I'm saying to the bank because it's coming from directly from Christ. This is the gospel. This is the truth. This is the revelation of, of God that he gave to me. And you need to obey it and follow it and listen to it uh, because it's not my words. It's not my authority because the authority has been given to him by God, by Christ himself. Uh, so he is again standing on that which we see him again do in other letters where he has he has the ability to do that 
you know, unlike men today or unlike many men at the, in that day where they can stand and he can stand and say, look, I am here by the authority of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, and so certainly, you know, we can say that, that, hey, I can say boldly by the authority of the word of God, you know, that I can proclaim something from here that is true because it is because it's the word of God. Um, so he certainly uses that to try to urge this church and, and the other churches and letters that he has to get back on track and to get into the right frame of mind and to the right um, path, you know, of their, of their sanctification. So as he says there, look in verse 16. I urge you then be imitators of me. Okay, or I exhort you to be imitators of me. Flip over to chapter 11 real fast and look at verse 1. And he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Or, or some versions say, follow me as I follow Christ. Right? There's, there's the prerequisite, Paul's saying. Yeah, follow me, listen to me, imitate me, as long as I'm following Christ and imitating Christ and I'm on the right track and on the right path, then, then you're well to do as I do. Okay, let's look at another one. Flip over to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to start back in verse 12 uh, because this is just a, a great part of the passage. We're going to look at verse 15 to 17, but let's start up at 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this. And he's talking to them about you know, righteousness um, and faith in Christ and the same type of things that we're talking about back in Corinthians, about you know, growing in your sanctification and, and, and maturing. And he's saying, I haven't attained it, right? I'm not... I'm not where I need to be. I am not perfection, okay? So he says, uh, not that I have attained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on, he says again, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in according to the example you have in us. So he's speaking here of the weak and of the strong. Okay, and we see that contrast in the book of Romans as well. And he says, follow those. He said there again, the same thing, imitate me imitate the mature and he says look to the ones who are mature who have attained some level of maturity look towards them as good examples of what you should be doing so that is certainly uh the case even in our in our own lives that uh perhaps there's men or women in in your life and certainly maybe in, in earlier years of your faith if you've been uh in the faith for many years if you were younger and, and less mature you know maybe you had a mentor or mentors or people that you could look at um you know to help you understand scriptures or that you could e even i think of some men that even you know i had some men that certainly were scripturally sound and would teach me and talk to me through things but then i think of other men who were just you know just good examples of looking at someone who's humble looking at someone who's a humble husband and a humble father and a godly man in the way that he conducts himself you know in in every walk of life it seems um, you know, to look to people like that that are a good example and to be like, you know what, I can be, he's got some good attributes that I certainly would like to imitate, uh, which obviously we can ultimately point to looking at Christ, right, as the perfect example. And so we always understand that. But it, he also gives us brothers and sisters and as a benefit to help us in our sanctification process, to be able to towards people as examples and and so as paul says do that and look to me and imitate me and follow me as i follow christ and and i could say that to a brother you could say that to someone that's certainly what we want to be and as we grow in more maturity we should we should doesn't it make sense that uh, compassion you know we should grow in all the ways 
of Christ, all the attributes of Christ. If that's what sanctification is, then we should be coming more like him and so more gracious, more merciful, right? We should continue to be getting more like that. Um, then if that's the case, then we should be growing to be better examples to people. We, we should be a better testimony to people and uh, to Christ. And your neighbor should be able to, to look to you and be like, man, you know, that guy's a really good guy or a godly man. And, and certainly we have to open our mouth and share the gospel with them. But uh, people can certainly look to us, uh, you know, as, as examples and people to imitate. Right. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, the way he words it, I guess, you know, it does kind of sound arrogant. But really all right. he's saying is it's like spurring each other along you know he's like come on let's do it together come with me we're gonna go right we're, we're going together right yep that's exactly right which is why i wanted us to go to those two passages because you're right if you just kind of take it you know take it for what it's worth and you're just reading this for the first time or looking at the sections like man you know it does sound like wrong motives possibly or whatever but again when you see the totality of his writings and the ones we went to and other things you just know that he's doing exactly what you're saying uh, you know which is which is it's good example, and which means it's good example for us to be doing, um, to certainly look at others and, and and be mindful of attributes and characteristics that they, you know, to say to somebody like, hey, man, that guy is really, you know, he's really gracious. He's always very gracious towards people and very kind, no matter what happens. You know, more patient. I need to be that way. You know, I need to be more patient. Uh, whatever the thing is, and uh, and then certainly we should strive to be an example to other people, um, to, to help them, right? We, the goal is, as believers, to, to mature. So we want to look more like Christ. Like, we want people to see Christ in us, right? That's always one of my prayers, certainly uh, to my wife and to my children first, uh, you know, always, to, like, like let them see you and me. You know, like, that's what you want, right? Uh, you're, we're to be light of the world. Where we're supposed to be reflecting the light. Jesus is light, right? I'm not the light. We're to be reflecting life into the world, okay? And so um, we're, we're to be like Christ, too. So that's... And that isn't prideful and isn't arrogant to want to be like that, to want to attain that and be better at that. Um, sometimes you could say, well, you know, you want to be so perfect, you want to be this way, you know, you can, you can certainly, pride can certainly creep in there along the way in arrogance, but, uh, you know, we're to try to do it humbly. And that's certainly what Paul is talking about, and uh, certainly what he was a good example of. He, he's very humble, really. He, he doesn't like mention, like, I was blinded and then lived out in the desert by himself for several years, going through hell to learn yep. all the things. And it's like, I wouldn't be telling anybody that. But, <laughs> right. You know, that's right. Let me tell you where I've been. Yeah, yeah. That's testimony. He's pretty hard. Right. Right. Testimony. And I'm right. My testimony. That's right. You think you got it hard. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. Which he could do, you know, and he could boast about all that stuff. But, you know, as he says, I boast in my infirmities. Yep. I boast in my infirmities, you know, to to, to show um, Christ, you know, to, to have Christ exalted. He actually is like, you think you're bad? <laughs> That's what he boasts in. It's yep. how, bad he, how bad he was, you know. Yep. Yep. And he was, too. He was the baddest of the bad. That's right. Yeah. Until that, until that. And look how good God, God is. is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amen. Okay, verse 17. He says now, this is why I sent you Timothy, or this is why I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And it says, and he will remind you of my ways in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Okay, so this is, this is significant because now he's saying, okay, I've just told you to imitate me. I've just told you the maturity process. I just told you the expectations I have upon you and that you haven't met them. And I want to tell them to you again, explain them to you again. And he says, and this is why I sent Timothy. And which we're gonna see later in, in, the, uh, in the chapters as well that you know, when he sent this, he is obviously he states here that he's planning to want to come back to Corinth, uh, but he's sending Timothy now. So he's writing them this letter and saying, this is the reason I've done this. So that now, through Timothy, you can look at an example of what imitating me looks like. You see it? Here, here he comes. Here's Timothy. Here's a very mature yeah. believer. Uh, here is a child of mine in the faith, a beloved child of mine. When you read uh, First and Second Timothy, our letters from Paul to Timothy himself. 
Okay, and so he talks about Timothy being an elder in the church, being a pastor in the church. Remember, as we came through Acts, when he found Timothy on, on the mission journey and took him with him, he's been with them. He's with him like pretty much the rest of his life. And, you know, he's his, his protege. He's one of his guys, uh, Titus being another one, and I'm sure, you know, many others um, as well. But uh, we certainly see that in Timothy. So he's saying, look, here's, here's my representative, right. and he's going to come to you, and, and he's going to come and, and help you understand the things I'm talking about because you can look at him. He's living it. He's preaching it. He is what we're talking about. Um, you know, so exhibit A, right? Uh, this, this is what, what I want you to understand. And so, um, you know, just as he's instructing them to do now, he's saying, I'm sending you Timothy so you can see what I'm talking about, right? And look what he says about Timothy. So he charges Timothy with two things here in the rest of the, uh, the verses here in the rest of the chapter four. So one is to recall the things that Paul had taught them, Right? which they've obviously strayed from, and they obviously haven't been doing. So that's his responsibility. He says, uh, my faithful child, to remind you of my ways in Christ. So Timothy has got to come, and he is going to remind you of these things. Well, what does that mean? He's going to help you recall the things I taught. He's going to teach you again. I'm sending an elder. He's a pastor. He was mature. He's going to teach you. He's going to you know, lay on top of the foundation that I laid. He's going to get rid of all the junk that you guys have been putting on there, and we're wiping all that out. And Timothy is going to help you build this thing and to get this thing started. Okay? So all the things they weren't doing, Timothy is going to do. And Timothy is going to testify to the fact of the consistency of Paul's teaching in every place. You see that? He says, um, faithful child of the Lord, he will come to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So... The consistency of the gospel is what I'm talking about. And Timothy has been to numerous churches all over the place with me. And he can attend to the fact that this is the same foundation I've laid here. is the same foundation I laid in Thessalonica. Same foundation in Berea. Same foundation in Philippi. And on and on and on in Galatia and all over the place. It's the same foundation. It's Christ. You know, it's Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Um, you know, and, and died for your sins to the Jew, to the Gentile, all the things that, that we know he's taught and, uh, and laid in the foundation of the gospel, um, that it's the same everywhere, that, that it's not different here than it is anywhere else. You've got to stand on the solid rock of the gospel of Christ, and we've got to build on that. As Timothy can tell you, we've been building on churches everywhere on that, you know, and, and probably can report, Timothy certainly can report from other churches like mature churches like Philippi that we talked about the church, the letter to the Philippians um, you know where where it is a very mature church and so he can certainly tell them about those things and and the things that are happening in other churches to encourage them right to to admonish them and show them look this is what's happening in other places and this is what you can be doing here for the cause of Christ you know to encourage them to get get with it and get with the program So, now we see a little shift here in verse 18. 18 to 19, and even, uh, yeah, in 18 to 19 there, you'll see that Paul's really calling out these false teachers again. He's mentioned them, he knows that they're there, and he's saying right here, uh, kind of calling it out, saying these false teachers have taken advantage of the church because I haven't been there, right? If I was there, this wouldn't be happening. So, I'm gone, and the false teachers are taking advantage and coming in, which we've seen in other letters that he, that he writes as well, and, and forewarns them about saying, look, when I leave, the wolves are coming in. And in fact, there's wolves yeah. among you here that when I leave, <clears throat> your teeth are going to come out. Okay? So be weary of this. Why does he tell them that? To be mindful, to be watching for that. Well, how are they going to understand false doctrines and false teachers well, Jesus says in Matthew 7, you'll know them by their fruit, right? You'll know them by their fruit. It's, it's the counterfeit thing of, of the money again, the counterfeit money. You don't study all the counterfeit money. You, they study the actual money. They, they only study the real money. So then anytime counterfeit monies come, they're able to distinguish the differences because they know the real thing. So that's what Paul is saying. You've got to be able to know how to understand and recognize red flags and recognize and discern things. Uh, in order to do that, what do you got to do? You gotta be mature. You gotta know what God's word says. You gotta know what the gospel is. 
okay? So that's very important. So as he says here, uh, but um, he says, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, look, there, and, and I'm sure he was meaning even some of the church that were weary and scared of, of that Paul might show up. But he is certainly addressing these teachers and these people who have, have infiltrated the church. And he's saying, look, they think I'm, I'm not coming. I am coming to you. And I think some of their thought probably is, well, look, he sent Timothy. Like Timothy's here, and you think because I sent Timothy, they think I'm not coming. You know, like, I'm still coming. Like, the big dog's coming to hunt. Don't worry. Like, I'm coming to take care of these things. Timothy certainly is capable and is there to do it, but I'm coming to, to make sure of this on my own. Okay, so as he says, I will make my way there, and I will come to you. So regardless of what they think, in verse 19, he says, but I will come to you soon. Uh, and if the Lord wills, that's always a great and uh, appropriate little phrase to stick in there. And uh, James 4.15 talks about that, that you shouldn't uh, say things as if you are the one in charge, right? And so you can, you can look that one up a little bit later on. Well, we got, we got 15 minutes. We got time. Fifth over to James chapter 4. Always good to get exercising and, you know, grab the dumbbells, lift them. Let's get it. Let's uh, get into James 4, keep our workout kicking. I didn't realize that, that uh, phrase, that challenge was that old. <laughs> What's that? What he's basically saying there is like, like your, you know, your bark is loud, but I mean, he's like really saying, right? We're not. I'm not coming to really talk. Like, you know, right? I see my power. Yeah. I'm not all talk. Like, yeah. I'm coming to see what you guys are made of. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Totally. So he says, uh, look at verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mitts or a vapor, other, uh, other translations say, that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. You see that? Sounds familiar, right? All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. But look back into um, right verse 15 there is what we're talking about. You ought to say and you should say if the Lord wills. So look, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't make plans. Don't plan on doing things and say, well, I really shouldn't plan because I don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what the next breath, you don't know what tonight holds. Uh, you know, and Jesus talks about that also, you know, as he says, uh, don't be anxious for tomorrow, right? Because today has enough problems in itself. You, today's got enough issues. Don't worry about tomorrow yet. Um, just, just live according to seeking the, the seeking God's will and seeking His kingdom, and don't get caught up in that. But it doesn't mean don't make plans. But He's saying don't plan it as if you're the one who's all powerful and can can do all these things because you don't have the power of authority to do anything. You can you can make a plan to. Uh, you know, to go do whatever you want next week, but you don't even know that you'll be alive next week. So you should always say, uh, you know, that, hey, I'll see you tomorrow, Lord willing. You know, something like that, because we obviously understand as believers, everything falls under God's sovereign will. So Paul also, uh, being human and not knowing yet, um, and I think you can certainly see that there in verse 19, but I will come to you if the Lord wills which we saw him say in Romans as well, I think uh, Colossians he says as well, that I long to come and see you. You know, I want to come and see you, but I haven't been able to up to this point, and, and my desire is to come and see you. Uh, so he's certainly saying, look, I'm coming. If the Lord's allowing me to come, I'm going to be there. Um, and so that's the way we should say things, because it certainly is uh, God's will that we want to be doing. It. Okay, so I am coming to you soon. Flip over to chapter 16. Last chapter of because uh, I want you to see about this. I will come to you soon. Same with with Timothy. Let's look at verse five. <clears throat> Start there. This is the closing of of this first letter. Paul says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia. Now, 
remember from our map in your head, if you could, you saw that map so many times, you should be able to see it. I can still see that map in my brain. I've seen it so many times from the Acts study. Macedonia is up on the top there, and it has Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. Okay, so that's Macedonia. Then when you come down uh, around to the left there on the coast, that's where Greece was with Athens and Corinth. So he's saying he's passing through Macedonia again, which is Philippi and all that area. And he says, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want you to see me now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. Well, what do you know? He says it right there again, right? Verse 8, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for uh, which Ephesus was over in Asia, okay, a little bit over there. So he's still making that, that trip around again, okay? But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Verse 10, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace that he may return to me, for I so you see here at the closing of the letter, he's saying Timothy's coming, right? And when Timothy gets there, okay? So he's sending the letter, he's sending Timothy. So I just want you to be mindful of, obviously, the letter, you know, it's not like it's an email and Timothy catches a, uh, you know, the first flight tonight on standby and he's there in the morning. Uh, he's sending the letter, and a lot of times he would send it with the messenger, like send it with Timothy and he'll go. Okay, but he sends the letter, and in the letter he's saying, I'm going to send Timothy to you. And so he still says in the end there, my point is that he's still saying again there, I plan on coming to you. Mm -hmm. And now we see what the coming to you looks like, like you were talking about, um, Sam, that certainly he's coming with, with this intent towards the, towards the false teachers and with this intent towards the immature believers. And so we see there that his intent is to stay for a while. He says, I don't want to see you in a passing by. He says, I want to see you and spend some time with you because obviously it sounds like there's a lot of work to be done here right and which is why he's sending timothy because you're going to stop in ephesus for a while because a a big door of ministry it says mm -hmm. a window of opportunity is there and adversaries are there i could be here for a while and then i'm gonna pass through macedonia on the way so it can take a little while before i get there so before i get there timothy's going to come and hang out with you but i'm coming and i'm going to be there for a while okay so so that's his intent is uh is if the lord wills and allows that to happen that uh that we certainly uh, and we certainly know from our study in Acts, remember that this letter was written on his second journey. And he is going to. So we know that that is, in fact, going to happen. And if I'm correct, uh, I believe he spends like 18 months there. Okay. So, uh, so we know that he does, that the Lord does will, and he will get there, and he does spend a lot of time. And I think I said that wrong. I think it's the first trip, as I'm auto-correcting now. I think it's the first trip uh, that he goes to Corinth. As long. But still, regardless, he wants to spend some time there to, uh, to lay some groundwork. And uh, he's already led the foundation. He wants to be there to do some work in this church. So as uh, Sam was saying, look at the, look at the attitude he has here. Um, right? The um, righteous kind of indignation towards false teachers, which, look, we should have, okay? We understand that, guys? John and I were talking about a, a song, you know, earlier, uh, false teachers. And look, it, I mean, forever, but certainly less since the 70s, 70s and 80s. Dude, the American... calling out people and even calling names out saying look man you know this this guy's wrong proper and so we have to call out um you know those kinds of things to help people with with discerning what is right away from this stuff keep these guys out okay we we need more pauls in the church today okay a lot more pauls in the church today he says, I don't care so much about their words. Of power. 
and infants, right? In the worldly sense, the worldly wisdom that we talked about, uh, but not in godliness and spiritual wisdom, wisdom, which is the wisdom of God, which he already contrasted for them uh, before. So they certainly have that going on for them, which is a negative, negative that Paul's got to correct. Okay, so he says in verse 20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. And that's certainly truthful, right? I mean, anything that has to do with God is powerful. rest in church. okay certainly we know that one day jesus christ will come and set up the millennial literal kingdom on the earth but we certainly know that his kingdom exists now as he talks about that you know the, the kingdom is at hand uh he certainly is a king already understand uh we we aren't in that that millennial kingdom time frame yet but we are going to be with the king for all of eternity uh you know to some degree uh we talked about god's the kingdom of god is in the heart of every believer right he, he is the king of our hearts. He is the king of our lives now. He should be the king now. We, we certainly are in, in the world right now and in a falling world, but thankfully we aren't citizens of this world, right? We are citizens of his kingdom. He is our king. And so he, he should be sitting on the, the throne of our, our heart as the king in, in us now. So as an individual, as a church, certainly uh, the power is in the spirit of God. Okay? And he closes back now to as he gives the the warning coming to the false teachers and, and what he's coming to talk to them about look at verse 20 and 21 uh, 21 excuse me he says what do you wish shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness so now he's he's saying to the church now he's like look what do you how do you want this to go down because I'm coming to you and it can go one of two ways and that that choice and that decision is up to you so i'll figure that out way. that's right you want to go the easy way you want to go hard, the hard way I'm because coming with the power i'm coming of the kingdom and i'm going to do what i'm called to do and you can be ready for it with right the power of god like, and a rod if you want <laughs> doesn't he say something about their power we'll see who see what your power yeah those arrogant that he talks about um who are saying that he's not coming like the false teacher you know well he's not going to come or even some doubters in the church you know and he's saying okay well we'll see how their power is when i get there because the, the power of god like you said rests in his kingdom and it rests in me <laughs> so i'm coming under the authority and the, with the, the authority of christ and the power of the kingdom of god and i can come to you with a rod if you'd like or if you humble yourselves and you want to to take the reprimand and take the admonition and you want to take reproof and correction, we can certainly do it in the, in the gentleness of, of kindness and do it right. See, I don't remember, that's kind of, I don't remember that standing out like that before, but he's basically saying like, he's not gonna let, not gonna let that happen. He's not gonna give up on that church. I'm gonna come right. straight this out. It's not like just a letter of encouragement or, you know, hey, we need to change this. We need to figure it out. He's basically saying, I'm not gonna let this happen. Yeah. Like, I don't, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and that's, that's what, and that's to the heart of what I was meaning, uh, you know, about we certainly obviously knew, need more Pauls in the, in the church uh, because obviously we always knew stronger, you know, stronger, gifted, godly leaders. But, I mean, part of, part of the responsibility of shepherding, part of the responsibility of elders, of pastors is to feed the sheep, to defend the sheep, right? As you're shepherding the flock, you are to defend the flock. Uh, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, Jesus says. That, that's what you're told to do. You are to guard them and protect them. Um, you know, and, and then Paul talks about that too, that that's part of your, your calling as well, is not to... That means to stand up for the word, and for those who are not doing the right job, you're to stand men and women and you need to be guarding those men may not be a part of the the flock here at you know the church maybe that i'm pastoring at but you certainly have a, a due responsibility and a due diligence to do if you know that a brother or sister in crisis is in another church or is a situation where you know that is detrimental or it's heretical or it's you know whatever that is you have a responsibility to try to help them you know so Certainly, exactly right. I mean, that, that's, think about that's part choice. of the calling. That's part of the job description. <laughs> you even think about Jesus talking, you know, 
about his sheep, and that he hasn't, he won't, you know, lose not even one of them. That's right. That's right. And leads the ninety-nine, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Four to one. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as Sam said, he won't lose a one, right? The all the elect are the elect. All those who are are called, but you know, with the effectual calling, will be saved. And so, I mean, uh, that's a little bit different, I get, but it's still the same kind of principle. Yes, right. I mean, Paul, you know, is you know, he's a huge influence on, on those people's salvation, and he feels like, you know, they're kind of like his. <laughs> oh, he, uh, yeah, he definitely feels responsible. I mean, look at how he always talks about it, right? My beloved children. Always. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's that's what he's talking about. And again, John John does the same thing, um, talking about it, you know? So it's, uh, it is it is how they felt. And so they do have a responsibility in that. And certainly as he unpacked, I'm your spiritual father. You know, you have all these tutors, but I'm the spiritual father. God used me to plant the seed in you that was the effectual seed that he gave the, the increase that he talked about before. God did that and he used me to do that. And so I have a stake in this and I have a part in this thing and I'm going to help you, uh, you know, get back on track. I'm going to help you mature in this process because uh, you haven't been watered well. You haven't been nurtured well. You haven't been cared for well. Uh, and you haven't been caring for yourself. Not doing it. You're not even capable and able to do it. So I'm coming back now to, to help you do that, to get you to a point where you need to be you need to be going forward doing that. You know? So good. Um, any other closing thoughts, questions, comments? Complaints? If they're complaints, you can call Brian. <laughs> write a letter to the church. <laughs> yeah, put Pastor Brian on it. <laughs> Not officially. Still on. Not right. official. But I'm sure. Still on. Yep. You know that. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you guys.